Hi, I'm Jan Bitkowski. I'm director of the Banbury Centre here at Corspring Harbour. And this is the third day of the 2013 uh, Corspring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, so it's the third day and it's a, a hot and steamy day. And uh, I have with me David Baltimore and we are probably going to be perspiring. Schwitzing together. <laughs> yeah, is that the uh, more polite term? That's a New York term. Okay. Um, David, I have to confess, I missed your talk. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about a regulation of NF kappa B. Was that the No, actually, theme? I was talking about uh, what happens when you knock out a single microRNA in the genome and the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And this is a microRNA we've been working on now for a number of years that is induced by NF kappa B. Oh. So it part of the overall program that I've been developing to understand NF kappa B. But uh, this microRNA, 146A, is a feedback regulator of NF kappa B. And when you knock it out, and then you have an inflammatory condition, stimulation, uh, the inflammatory state goes on too long because it doesn't have the feedback regulation to turn it off. Mm -hmm. There are actually a number of feedback regulators, but this, this one is sufficient to cause pathology. So you get a, what's called uh, inflammatory hematopoiesis, in which you start getting many too many myeloid cells and not enough lymphocytes and red blood cells. And this is inflammation of, of, of what well, tissue? Or it's what? not actually of a tissue. We, we model it by simply injecting lipopolysaccharide as if there were bacteria in mm -hmm. the circulation. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a reaction to uh, bacterial uh, PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular structures. Mm -hmm. And the, so these, these mice with the knockout of the microRNA then go on and develop lymphomas? And, and, and they, go, they, they, they go on and develop myeloid leukemia, uh, lymphomas, as well as lymphoid lymphomas sometimes. Mm. And that takes about a year and a half. And so the question is, what's going on over a year and mm -hmm. a half, and why does it take so long? And the answer is that it, it's chronic inflammation. So we can model this by just injecting lipopolysaccharide into the animals uh, at a low dose over a, a significant mm. period of time. And it's a, a model for how inflammation can lead to cancer. I was just thinking, as you were saying that, that I seem to recall that there's been a long history of inflammation or, well, the way that theories rise and fall in cancer over the past hundred and something years. Yeah. Inflammation has been one of those, uh, right. an early one, I think. That's uh, right, and there, there's been a lot of evidence from many points of view that inflammation is somehow involved in cancer and that anti-inflammatory compounds actually can be protective. And how much have you f found out about the mechanism, about what, what is going on in this long Well, we know a lot about period. it because uh, 146A is a negative regulator of the uh, signal transduction molecule, TRAF6. And TRAF6 activates NF-kappa B, and NF-kappa B activates the IL-6 gene. And the IL-6 IL is the major inducer of the pathology that we see. Mm. So we can mute the pathology with a knockout of NF-kappa B or of IL-6. Mm. And was this an unexpected finding, that the, the knocking down the microRNA had this well, yes, when we first found it, we were very surprised uh, because it didn't seem like a large enough effect to lead to cancer. Mm -hmm. But it is. The thing is, it takes time. Yeah. And so the animals actually are quite normal for the first couple of months of their life and then slowly deteriorate thereafter. Oh. Is this a... a not necessarily a criticism, but, but something that needs to be thought about when people use animal models. If you use a, a, a method that acute that m produces a cancer in an acute fashion, uh, as opposed to maybe 
perhaps in most well, in many circumstances a chronic. Th there are many ways thing. to cause cancer. So, as we did years ago, you can inject the BCR able gene into a, a mouse and get cancer in a relatively short length of time because it's very potent and in certain cells it seems to act as an oncogene without at least any other obvious gene being needed mm -hmm. for it to cause at least the early stages of, of uh, disease. Uh, and then there are things like we're talking about which take a very long period of time, which are very indirect. So although we know the pathway that's involved, the question is in which cells is this pathway acting? Is it acting in the tumor cells or is it acting in supporting cells, derivative cells, that are then feeding back through IL-6 on the stem cells? And what we found is that it, that it looks like a lot of it is feeding back on the stem cells. Mm -hmm. Although, if the stem cells are mutant, they are more susceptible. It's a, it's a difficult question. Mm. You, you, you laid out that regulatory pathway. Um, do, you, do you look at these, these sorts of pathways or these problems from a, an evolutionary perspective as well? How do, how do these complicated path regulatory pathways arise? Is well, no, I haven't looked at them much from an evolutionary standpoint uh, what we really want to know is in one animal in the mouse uh, how do they work mm. and what are their vulnerabilities and then what we want to do is to take those vulnerabilities and see if they relate to human disease mm. that was going to be my next question so the so can you draw a parallel the, what are the are the clear cases of inflammatory induced cancers in human beings? Well, I'll turn it around. The, the most obvious uh, human disease that looks like the 146A knockout is, is myelodys uh, di myelodysplastic syndrome. That's a situation in which you um, lose bone marrow function, and that's what we see in these animals, and you get myeloid cancers. Uh, as a long-term consequence, and that's what we see in these animals. Mm -hmm. So, um, it may be that this is uh, a model for myelodysplastic syndrome. It certainly is a mechanism that leads to myelodysplasia. Mm -hmm. you, so, one of your, your major tools is, is producing knockout, knockout mice. Knockout mice are critical right. to everything that we do. And uh, I guess, how long have knockout mice been around? When did the homologous recombination come in with Oliver and uh, 20 years ago? 20 years ago is what I was going to guess, yeah. but my sense of time as I get older <laughs> gets worse and worse. Yeah. Well, on that, on that very theme, <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were just talking that uh, I have you down as coming, first coming to the attending a symposium in 1962. I, I think it was probably the first meeting that I attended as a member of the scientific community. But in the summer of 59, I was here as an ERP student, as mm. a high school student, mm. I mean, as a college student. Uh, and if memory serves me right, I went to the symposium that mm. year. Yeah, I, I can't, um, can you remember what this uh, I don't remember what it was on. No, I can't remember either. But it's easily looked up. Yes. I was thinking that about, uh, coming back to the knockout mice, the degree to which, the way in which biological research can be done these days, that the the extraordinary techniques that have come about, say over about the past twenty years, or even even over the past ten years, ha that they've transformed um, the questions that can be asked to which you can expect to get an answer. It's it's a continual process. I mean, there's no reason to date it. It's happening today. It happened last week. It happened two years ago. It happened ten years ago. It happened twenty years ago. Um, when I started in molecular biology, which was in the early 1960s, you couldn't do anything that we do today. The things we take for granted today mm -hmm. were inconceivable then. Sequencing, cloning, um, knockout mice, identifying genes, all of that was... Uh, and that's why I went into virology, actually. 
because viruses were small enough and manipulable enough that you could learn a lot more about them than you could about mammalian genes, which were sort of lost mm. in the chromosomes and all of these complicated things that we really didn't understand at all. Yes. In fact, I said your, that 1962 symposium was basic mechanisms in animal virus biology. That, that's right. So that's 62, right. so the genetic code had only just been broken. Martin uh, yes. Nuremberg got the first code on it. Mm. And uh, yeah, 66 was the, the big symposium here on the genetic code. But we didn't uh, even think in terms of the code. Actually, I thought a lot about the code per se, but I couldn't do anything with it in the context of viruses because we couldn't clone the genome, we couldn't sequence the genome. We didn't know anything about what encoded the proteins. We basically knew about protein length. Mm. What would you, what, in your own research, what's hindering, what, te what technique would you like to have that you could apply in your in your current research, well, the, the pie in the sky sort of. Yeah, I mean, the thing that would have, I would have said, if you'd asked me this a year or so ago, would be a simple, cheap way to make point mutations mm. in the genome. But I think we have that now with the CRISPR-Cas system. And so uh, that that will just make, make research so much more precise. Mm -hmm. Because instead of hypothesizing that, or oh, take a micro, I, I work a lot with microRNAs, take a microRNA. So we, we use a variety of techniques to uh, convince ourselves that a given microRNA binds to a given three prime untranslated region and that this is the sequence that does it and that that then is a controlling element for the downstream effects. But now I can make a mutation in that binding site which will unambiguously show mm -hmm. us that that will, mm. that will be true or not true. So uh, I think it's just wonderful what uh, you, you sort of wish for something and then if you keep your eyes open, it happens. Well, David, I think we should draw it to an end before we get too uh, Yeah, well too fried. Crisp. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank Good. you.